Welcome everybody to our little Bible study, and I'm so happy you could join us. Today we're going to be covering Acts chapter 2, and the word, um, the book is called the Acts of the Apostles. Acts means actions. It's the actions that the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven caused the apostles, and the two main ones are Peter and Paul. The actions that our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven by His Spirit had them do. That's what the book of Acts is all about. So, um, and it's also about the transition from Peter to Paul. So we're going to be covering a lot today. And so let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father God, we thank you that we are accepted in your beloved Son and that you have given us your perfect word in the English language, in the King James Bible. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us all enlightenment today and um, understanding of your word rightly divided. And we thank you, Lord, for all the people who are watching, and we pray that they may uh, be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And uh, it's not about us, Lord. It's all about your word. And that's what we want to hear today, is that we want to hear from you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so back to Peter and Paul in a minute. But first, let me just say that every farmer knows that everything doesn't, the whole harvest doesn't ripen at the same time. There's a few shoots that come up, come up first. And if you gather the grain from the first shoots, we call it the first fruits. And our Lord Jesus Christ was the first fruits of those who would have the glorified bodies. We're going to be covering that a little bit later. So here is a sheave of the first fruits. Now, today we're also going to be talking a little bit about the... Um, two loaves, wave loaves, that the priest would wave and, and offer to God. So we'll cover those today a little bit. And we're going to talk about in Acts chapter 2, of course, the coming down from the Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father of the Holy Ghost on the upper room. So we're going to be covering all that. Um, let me get rid of those. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's get started, Patty. Okay. Um, Acts chapter 2, the renewed offer of the kingdom by the Holy Ghost, verses 1 through 4, the Holy Ghost comes down from heaven. 5 through 13, the men of Judah investigate. 14 through 21, Peter explains what happened at Pentecost. It's his first sermon. 22 through 36, Peter quotes Joel and Psalms. He accuses Israel of killing their Messiah. 37 through 40, terrified, the Israelites ask, what should we do? 41 through 47, Believers are added to the church, and they sell their possessions. Um, now, when we come to this chapter, we might have some questions. Was Pentecost the birthday of the church that we are have today? What was the purpose of the speaking in tongues? What was the wonderful works of God in verse 11? Who was Peter addressing in his first sermon? When did David know that he would be resurrected? If Jesus is Lord, why is he not ruling in Jerusalem today? What gospel did Peter preach? How is the Holy Spirit for the body of Christ different from the Holy Ghost coming down on the um, upper room? Why did the believers, well, let me just say, it is the same spirit, but it, the same spirit is manifesting itself in a different way, okay? 
So why did the believers sell their possessions? We're going to cover that. So, um, and if we get to it, we'll talk a little bit about the new world order. Um, Peter, um, Acts is about Peter in the beginning of Acts. And then um, we first get introduced to Paul in Acts chapter 7. And he gets saved in Acts chapter 9. And there's a, uh, we said last week, if you didn't hear Acts chapter 1, I suggest you hear that one because they will help you a lot. Um, so there's an overlap between Peter and Paul, um, especially uh, since Paul's salvation at Acts 9 through 15. But we could say the overlap goes from 7 to 15. Um, in Acts chapter 15 is the last time we hear from Peter. Then Paul takes it the rest of the way from chapter 7 to 28. So um, the purpose of Acts is to show the fall and diminishing of Israel. So when we um, are in early Acts, we get the fun of um, looking at Israel's history. So we're going to be talking about the divided kingdom that becomes a united kingdom under Jesus. So Saul, King Saul, King David, and Solomon, his son, they all ruled for 40 years each. Then after Solomon died, the kingdom was divided into the northern Israel and the southern Judah. But the Lord Jesus Christ will talk about that he will gather them into a united kingdom and rule over them for a thousand years. So the divided kingdom will become the united kingdom. And we're not talking about England. Okay, so let's go over the review last week. The review um, uh, sentence. So in chapter 1, it was the commission and ascension of Christ, the commissioning of Christ to the little uh, group of believing remnant, um, also called the little flock, and his ascension. And Judas was replaced while they were waiting for the coming of the Holy Ghost. So we said that there are three pivotal events in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 7 is the fall of the nation of Israel. And Acts chapter 9 is the salvation of Saul of Tarsus and the beginning of the dispensation of grace and the beginning of the body of Christ. In Acts chapter 15 is the postponement of the believing remnant's ministry, which is Peter's group. Because Paul had gone to Jerusalem at the Jerusalem Council and explain that God had begun a new um, uh, program or a new dispensation, and he was doing something different, and he had put them on hold. And so uh, we're going to be covering that as we get to it. So um, just to go over, okay, that's good. So. Um, we, we can look at the Bible, um, you know, because um, in a, in, as prophecy, mystery, prophecy. Um, prophecy, mystery, prophecy. And so um, the books of the Bible is laid out in an orderly fashion. From Genesis to Acts 9 is prophecy. And Peter, uh, um, after, you know, in and around the cross, was the main apostle. And um, then um, he, um, Paul becomes the main apostle in mystery. And those books are Romans to Philemon. Then after our rapture and after the seven years of tribulation, in the second coming of Christ, Peter will again be resurrected. Mm -hmm. And the books Hebrews through Revelation is about how to get through the seven years of tribulation and into the kingdom 
And um, so he will have another chance on earth. He'll be resurrected, and we'll be resurrected at the rapture. Now, the key uh, verse in the Bible is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, which says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we have to divide prophecy from mystery. Now, in early Acts, the chart is closed. So we don't, they didn't know about the mystery yet. So the yellow part is not showing today. Um, and we're going to come to the main scenes that will be taking place, which is the coming of the Holy Ghost and the little flames of um, divided cloven um, tongues of fire on the apostles who then lit and began to speak um, in tongues, um, understandable languages. So after the coming of the Holy Ghost, which was like a mighty wind, we're going to go into all that, and um, that sound was so incredible, all the people in Jerusalem came running to see what had happened. And so the second scene is the people coming out of the upper room, spilling out into the street, and Peter standing with the twelve to explain to the people who are staying at Jerusalem for the Pentecost feast, the Feast of Pentecost, what happened. So that's his first sermon. And see this little thing up here? In the city of Jerusalem was the sepulcher of King David, and his ashes were in there. Well, so we're going to take these down. Let's see. Patty, can you take those? Sure. And just put them behind you. Okay. Yeah, there. Okay, so um, today I want to show you that um, when um, Peter, in his sermon, I mean before his sermon, when, he, when Luke actually talks about the different nations that were represented at Jerusalem, there were 16 nations. And he will tell about those nations in an orderly fashion. So here in the blue, we're in Jerusalem. So he'll talk about the nations that are in the east. And he'll talk about the nations that are in Asia Minor. That mm -hmm. came, those people who came. And then he'll talk about um, those people who came from northern Africa. And also from Rome, Crete, and Arabia. Mm -hmm. So he, he goes in over those nations in an orderly fashion. 16. 16 nations. So also today, in the middle of our talk, we will be talking about the captivity of um, Israel and Judah. And so um, the captivity of Israel was three different parts were um, over, you know, taken captive at different times. So first, Reuben, um, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh was taken captive by, I think it was Tiglath Pilser. And then um, Samaria, and then the rest of Israel, you know, so Samaria and then the rest of Israel were taken captive. So there's three times, three parts were taken captive in Israel. Now, the southern um, kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, were taken captive in three deportations by King Nebuchadnezzar to, um, to Babylon. And in the first um, deportation uh, was Daniel. So um, let's, um, in, in our talk today, we're going to find out that the two wave loaves that I showed you, mm -hmm. let, me, let me get those back, mm -hmm. they represent... Israel and Judah, and and also um, the Lord. Um, remember, He's going to make a united kingdom. He He talks about how the uh, Judah and Israel were like two sticks in Ezekiel, and He's going to join them into one stick. Mm. And, and so we're going to be covering that. And um, 
the Lord Jesus Christ in um, John 10, when he talks about another, he has another um, fold that he's going to make into one fold. That's Israel. That's they're not the Gentiles. Hmm. That other fold is Israel. So let's go over our chart a little bit. So today we will be talking about um, how King David, King David is going to be resurrected in the kingdom and sit with Christ at his right hand. Hmm. So from um, Psalm uh, 16 and Psalm 110, we will find out that David will be resurrected in the kingdom to sit with um, with the Lord Jesus Christ and to rule uh, over Israel while the Lord Jesus Christ will rule, rule over the whole world. And so um, we will find out that there was... Um, there was the old covenant, which you can see here maybe is uh -huh. that Moses is holding the Ten Commandments. Uh -huh. So the old covenant has been done away with. Uh -huh. And so this heart here represents the new covenant, uh -huh. which um, the coming of the Holy Ghost in Acts 2-4 uh -huh. is um, a t foretaste uh -huh. of the new covenant. So, um, when um, the Holy Ghost is giving a renewed offer to the nation of Israel to accept that Jesus Christ, the, of Jesus of Nazareth, was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And um, they are going, the leaders are going to reject that offer. And Stephen is going to see the Lord Jesus Christ standing up, ready to begin the mm -hmm. wrath. The seven years of tribulation. Mm -hmm. Because when Joel prophesied of the coming of the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. he also prophesied of the coming wrath. When the sun will go dark. See, Patty? Mm -hmm. See that sun? Mm -hmm. See that dark mm -hmm. up here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're looking at I'm sorry, I've read my notes. <laughs> and the red note, oh. and the red moon. Uh -huh. The moon will be turned into blood. Uh -huh. Okay, and I believe that will be because there's going to be pillars of dark clouds from oh. Jesus Christ coming back and, and you know, destroying Antichrist mm -hmm. um, at his second coming in, at Armageddon. Mm -hmm. But before the Lord Jesus Christ sets, okay, so when he um, sets up his kingdom, before mm -hmm. he sets up his kingdom, mm -hmm. um, there's going to be... A new world order. Oh, yeah. A new world order, or we could say uh, a false one world religion mm -hmm. and a false one world uh, government mm -hmm. under Antichrist will be similar to what Nimrod set up at the Tower of Babel. Okay, so there will be a false one world government till we get our true king. Our true king, we won't, there won't be peace on this earth until the true king reigns. Mm -hmm. Now, when David mentioned his Psalm 16, mm -hmm. he's not going to be the one that ascended to the right hand of the Father. That was the Holy One. The Holy One ascended to the right hand of the Father. Mm -hmm. But David will be on earth mm -hmm. next to that Holy One. Okay, and he'll be happy to see his countenance. So uh, there's a lot going on in Psalm 16, and we're going to take it apart for you. So um, without further ado, let's go over the books. Okay. Okay, so um, I have a, a primer on how to rightly divide the word of truth. That's an overview of the Bible in a hundred pages and it um, helps you to learn how to rightly divide this is the the main and the most important book to get okay so um then we have that in spanish too el secreto de dios and we these are all available on amazon this is um a little uh book that does the same thing pretty much but in a um 
50 pages, is an overview of the Bible, and it, 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 it gives an uh, overview of right division, but not as well as God's secret. It's for, chil and, and for this children. It's for children, yeah. And this one is also in black and white for under $5. Um, this is an overview also of the Bible, um, and it's called, Why Was the Earth Without Form, Void, and Dark? So that's also an overview. Mm -hmm. After you finish God's Secret, you'll want to get into Romans, a concise commentary. Mm -hmm. Then move along with the order of Paul's books. 1 Corinthians, uh, a commentary. 2 Corinthians, a commentary and Galatians, a commentary. Now, in these books, you only have to read one set of commentary, because I give it twice. And then, um, Ephesians, a commentary, and Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, a commentary. The Certainty of the Pre-Tribulation Rapture in black and white, or you can get it in color. I, I really, uh, this is um, Thessalonians chapter, I mean, first and second Thessalonians commentary. And the color is just incredible. It's just amazing um, how great the maps look. Um, then we recently came out with um, Paul's pastoral epistles in uh, the commentary on uh, 1st and 2nd Timothy, um, Titus, and Philemon. So uh, this book um, is is has that commentary, and it also has, in the end of the book, um, a, a, a uh, directory for the um, Grace Churches in the United States and in Europe and some other places in the world. Now, if you don't want to do this study course and you want to just have the commentary, you can get just the commentary that's in those books without this, you know, special goodies in um, First uh, Treasure Hunt, Volume 1 and 2 and 3. So this is all the commentary available for around $25. And then we are going to be using um, Lori Verstegen's book through the Book of Books. And our homework for next week is to do page 121. So, um, and if you want to, you can be really ambitious and do page 122. And I have on God's Secret Facebook page, I have a link to her book. Um, and so um, you can find it through the Book of Books by Lori Verstegen. It covers the whole Bible and it's a fill-in book. And we use it for our Bible studies. Okay, so let's get going, Patty. Okay. Um, if you get ready um, to read mm -hmm. um, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Okay, so everyone have, have Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Go ahead, Patty. All right. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So God's purpose for the day of Pentecost, that feast, was fully come and fulfilled on Pentecost, that which was the Pentecost that came after Christ, the first one after Christ's resurrection. Pentecost is also called the Feast of the Harvest in Exodus 23, 16, and 17, or the Feast of Weeks in Deuteronomy 16, 9, and 10. God had a harvest of kingdom believers in the spring, and he will have a future harvest in the fall, sometime after our rapture. The apostles and the other followers of Jesus were all together in the upper room with one consensus. Verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. All of the sudden... A sound from heaven, like a massive wind. The sound entered and filled all of the house where they were sitting. Notice that it was not a wind, but as of a mighty wind. It was not the sound of a wind in the treetops. It was more like the sound of a tornado. 
The sound of a tornado has been described as the sound of a thousand freight trains. The coming down to earth of the Holy Ghost was a one-time event. It was much louder and more powerful than a jet plane breaking the sound barrier. Jesus had told Nicodemus that the Spirit is invisible like the wind. It goes where it wants, and no one can enter the kingdom without it. Everyone in Jerusalem heard it and probably wondered, what was that? Or, what does it mean? Uh, verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Split tongues, similar to fire, appeared and rested on each of them. Notice that it was as of a fire, it was not a fire. Four. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. This supernatural phenomena was a sign that the Holy Ghost had indeed come to earth to fill and empower the true believers to witness um, the renewed offer of the kingdom to Israel. The baptism of the Holy Ghost was a fulfillment of Christ's promise to them at the exact time, in the very place, and for the precise purpose that he had predicted. God had made a covenant of sight with Israel. The ten plagues in Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea were signs that God did for Israel. The flames of fire were a sign that they had each received the power of the Spirit. And so was the speaking in tongues. The gift of tongues was the ability to speak and prophesy for God in a language they had not learned before. The purpose of tongues is to evangelize. Tongues is a sign for them that believe not, as it says in 1 Corinthians 14.22. During the Acts period, Paul and some believers had the sign of tongues to show the Jews that God was now working through Paul. So, so remember, and we're going to see later that Paul was also speaking in tongues for a short while. And so were, you know, the, the believers in Corinth. But we're not there yet, okay? But um, it was a sign for the Jews. Um the temporary sign gifts of the body of Christ died out in Paul's lifetime, as Paul said they would in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. All of them, the 120, were filled with the Holy Ghost that entered into them and began to speak with other languages. There were more than 12 nations and languages represented. Remember, I said it was 16. Mm -hmm. So, that means that it was not just the uh, 12 that had the gift of tongues, but all 120. Hmm. As the Spirit gave them utterance, the Spirit made them speak that uh, uh, languages that they had never learned. Hmm. So, uh, the prophesying in tongues was a miracle of God. Israel will need tongues in the future when the Jews are a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles. The coming of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost was God's fulfillment of the Spirit to Israel. The coming of the Holy Ghost on the two wave loaves, Judah and Israel, was the first fruits of the Lord, a foretaste of the new covenant promised, promise of His Spirit that will be in the kingdom. So that's mentioned the two wave loaves in Leviticus 23:17. The two loaves are Israel and Judah. The kingdom of Israel was divided into Israel and Judah after Solomon died. These two were two sticks but would be joined into one stick as mentioned in Ezekiel 37:15 through 28. Israel are the other sheep Jesus spoke of that he would make one fold in John 10, 16. There would be a united kingdom when Christ reigns in Jerusalem. 
The believing remnant in the upper room were the first fruits to have the spirit of the new covenant. They experienced the first fruit of kingdom life. While Christ was the first fruit of the dead to receive a glorified body, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 23. Hebrews speaks of the world to come. So the book of Hebrews is about the world to come. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's the world to come. Um, they haven't gone through the tribulation yet. And Hebrews will help them to know what to do. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, the promised spirit of the new covenant mentioned in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and Ezekiel 36, 24 through 28 at Pentecost, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come in the millennial kingdom. Okay, If they shall fall away by taking the mark of the beast to renew them again in, unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put, them to an, and put him to an open shame. They already crucified the king. Um, the Son of God is not going to die again for them if they take the mark of the beast during the tribulation. That is to put what Christ has done for the believers in prophecy to open shame. This, this is a quote from Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. Because Hebrews mentioned that they're in the last days. So the last days that began at, uh, the coming, uh, at Pentecost continue after the interruption is over uh, with um, Hebrews. So it's a continuation of the last days. In prophecy, the Holy Ghost was poured out on Pentecost on followers that already believed in Jesus. But in mystery, lost people who believe the gospel of grace, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, receive the indwelling Holy Ghost upon salvation without having to repent or be water baptized or doing any work of any kind, as it says in Romans 4, 5. Um, believers in the body of Christ have the Holy Ghost, as mentioned in Romans 5.5, 5, 1 Timothy 1.14, and Titus 3.5. Jesus had warned Israel that they could speak against him and it would be forgiven. But if they spoke against the Holy Ghost, when he came, it would not be forgiven, as he mentioned in Matthew 12.31 and 32 and Luke 12.10. The Holy Ghost had come, and this was Israel's last chance. It was their last chance to accept Jesus as their Messiah and be part of the kingdom. As we will find out in Acts 9, God interrupted prophecy and inserted the mystery, so the last chance to join the little flock of the believing remnant will resume after our rapture and through the tribulation. So the last chance continues a little bit after we're gone. When the disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost, what they said was actually God speaking. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Mark 13, 11. Just like the prophets of old, Ezekiel 11, 5, or those who wrote scriptures, 2 Peter 1, 20, 21. In contrast today, the Bible is written and complete. Colossians 1.25. No more revelation is being added. 1 Corinthians 13, 8-10. God speaks through the scriptures, and it is all we need to be totally equipped to live for Him today. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. And thy, Patty? And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. There were staying in Jerusalem Jews who were devoted to God from every nation under heaven. The Jews were to worship God in Jerusalem three times a year. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is the Feast of Weeks. 
as God had commanded them through Moses in Deuteronomy 16, 16. Verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. The disciples probably came out of the house to meet the people when everyone had heard the news that a bizarre phenomenon had taken place. Then a perplexed, bewildered crowd assembled together to investigate the unusual occurrence. Everyone was baffled because every man heard the followers speak in their own language. They were not speaking gibberish, but understandable languages. At the Tower of Babel, God separated the people and made them spread apart by making them speak different languages. I believe that this is how the earth was divided. Um, First Chronicles 119. Um, the dividing of the earth was not physical tectonic plates separating, but God did it by dividing the people by bringing about different languages back then at the Tower of Babel. Tongues at Pentecost was not a reversal of what God did at the Tower of Babel because it was a matter of supernatural speaking, not just hearing. Verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? The people could tell where they were from by their dialect. They were all amazed and marveled. How could uneducated people from Galilee suddenly be able to speak many languages? Eight. And how hear we, every man, in our own tongue, wherein we were born? And how was it that we are hearing in our own language of which we were born? Eight, nine uh, through eleven. Patty, real loud. Okay. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and, Phrygia. Uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. There were many tongues spoken by Jews throughout the Roman Empire. Jewish people from the Far East, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites heard. Jewish people from Mesopotamia, Judea. Jewish people from Asia Minor, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia. Also Jewish people from North Africa, Egypt, Libya, the region of Cyrene, strangers, Gentiles from Rome. A total of 16 places. Um, okay, did I say Arabia? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. 16. Okay, so at that time, Israel was occupied by the Roman Empire, and some of the Romans were interested in Israel's God. Were there Gentiles present at Pentecost? Yes, but Peter was addressing Jews and proselytes, as we will see in verse 14, 22, and 36. The Cretes and the Arabians may have been Jews, proselytes, or Gentiles. These people all said they heard in their language, oh, there were the Arabians, okay, um, the wonderful works of God. The disciples were not speaking rubbish or gibberish. The Jews from other places understood what they said. Mm -hmm. What was the wonderful works of God? Most likely that God raised Christ from the dead and that those who repented changed their minds and believed <clears throat> that the name of Christ was Jesus of Nazareth would receive remission of sins. Mm -hmm. Total forgiveness of the nation of Israel's sins or salvation will happen at Christ's second coming when they receive their glorified bodies. 
Um, believers in the body of Christ are forgiven of all trespasses the instant that we believe, as mentioned in Colossians 1.14 and 2.13. They were witnesses of okay, so they were witnesses of the resurrection of the King of the Jews, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, as mentioned in 122 and 313. Someone will ask, isn't the same message isn't this the same message that Paul Peter preached? Mm -hmm. Peter and Paul? I mean that Paul didn't Paul say what Peter said? Okay. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Paul spoke to a group that was yet to be disclosed. It was not revealed until Acts 9. It's another group of believers who will live in heavenly places. Paul said that Christ died for our sins in mystery. Peter and the other believers said Christ died for his people in prophecy. In prophecy, salvation is by faith that must be accomplished by works such as water baptism or mm -hmm. selling of belongings mm -hmm. in mystery believers are saved by faith and um, in christ alone mm -hmm. ephesians 2 8 and 9. Um, oh. 12. 2, 8, 9. and they were all amazed and were in doubt saying one to another what meaneth this did the Spirit of God take over the disciples, the 120 men and women, and cause them to speak the words of God in a language they had never learned? Yes. yes. That is not how the Spirit does in us today. If we want to learn a language, then we have to study it for many years. Mm -hmm. Even after six years <laughs> of studying Spanish, um, my Spanish is still pathetic. <laughs> but the disciples needed this gift of the Holy Ghost to be able to witness all over the world, and um, as mentioned in Acts 1.8, and to evangelize it in a short period of time during Daniel's 70th week, um, which was only seven years in duration. It would take an additional seven years to bring in the kingdom. The Spirit of God helps us to be enlightened and illuminated to what the Word of God says. But the Spirit doesn't take us over and cause us to speak for God. We need to study God's Word and think before we speak. The crowd was amazed and not sure what they should believe. If it was a sign and asked, what does this sign mean? What meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. They're full of some kind of new wine. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, let me make it up. Okay, 14, Patty. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up, up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hear, hearken. hearken to my words. The disciples must have, um, okay. So Peter stood up with the eleven apostles and addressed the men of Judea. Notice how it says, ye men of Judea. Mm -hmm. And all that were staying in Jerusalem for the observance of the Feast of Pentecost, Peter said, listen to my words, and I will explain this. Past 15, Patty. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Peter said, these are not drunk, as some suppose, since it's only 9 a.m. Patty, please read all the way from 16 to 21. Real loud. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out my, pour in those days of my... Pour out in oh, those days. Oh, pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show, show, show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness, 
and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. According to Joel's prophecy, as quoted by Peter, the pouring out of the Spirit on Pentecost was to be followed by the pouring out of God's wrath with signs in heaven and on earth. Peter identified exactly where they were in God's, on God's timeline that God gave to Daniel. Peter said, <clears throat> these are the last days before the wrath, Daniel's 70th week, the king and the kingdom um, comes, <clears throat> before the king and the kingdom comes. Peter said, this, the spirit speaking directly through them to the people, is that which the prophet Joel prophesied would happen in the last days. Joel 2, 28 through 32. It was something that had been prophesied, so it was not a mystery. The last days are mentioned seven times in prophecy. Um, and I give the verses for those seven times. The last time, the first time was in Genesis 49, verse 1. When Jacob tells each of his sons what will befall them in the last days. The last days point to the tribulation and the kingdom on earth. It is important to notice that the last days are also mentioned in Hebrews because Hebrews dovetails, like, you know, ties in. Um, or joins together with the conti and continues what Christ began with the believing remnant of Israel on Pentecost. And God, after God removes Israel's season of blindness, which they're in right now, Romans 11, 25 and 26, um, then um, the last days will continue. Let me make a note of that. Okay, so it was, it, this is Hebrews now. Have in these last days spoken unto us by his son, Hebrews 1, 2. The last days in Acts are, so it says last days in Hebrews 1, 2 also, okay? Mm -hmm. The last days in Acts are the same last days in Hebrews Daniel's 70th week before the king comes and sets up his kingdom. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them who heard him, Peter's group, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will? Okay, so we're not going. The Hebrews are not going to neglect that great salvation that they can be saved into the kingdom, as mentioned in Hebrews two and three. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, if, um, cha uh, Hebrews chapter two, verses three and four. They would not escape judgment at Christ's second coming if they don't endure to the end of the tribulation. For, uh, okay, they, if they don't believe and endure. For the members of the body of Christ, our salvation is secure, as mentioned in Romans 8, 35-39. One third of Israel will be saved through the tribulation into the kingdom on earth, as mentioned in Zechariah 13, 8. Israel's hope is eternal life, new bodies, and Christ's spirit in them, in the physical earthly kingdom. The hope of the body of Christ is a new body at the rapture. We already have his spirit in us and eternal life in heaven. They should not neglect what Jesus Christ had done by going back to Moses, the old covenant, or believing in Antichrist. Only the people who do not neglect the word of God have a chance of salvation through the tribulation. The tribulation is the last chance for Jews to believe God and join the remnant who will enter the kingdom and rule with Christ. It was the last chance for Israel to accept Jesus 
of Nazareth as their Messiah. They had allowed the prophet John the Baptist, sent by the Father, to be killed, which was strike one. They had murdered their Messiah, the Son of God, strike two. If Israel rejected the renewed offer of the kingdom through the Holy Ghost-filled disciples, it would be strike three. They would run out of Godhead members to reject because there are only three, as mentioned in 1 John 5, 7. God is one, but he, he's, um, he's in three persons. The Holy Ghost uh, Spirit had been prophesied in the Old Testament in Isaiah 32, 15 through 18, and 59, 21. Ezekiel 11, 19, and 20. Only repentance and faith could change God's mind. Only then would God save them from judgment through the tribulation and into eternal life in the earthly kingdom. God would deliver those of Israel who repent and believe him from judgment at his second coming and give them the promise of the Spirit. Those who repent and serve God will have his Spirit in them and be delivered from eternal punishment and live in the eternal kingdom on earth. Joel prophesied the Spirit of God being poured out hundreds of years earlier. By quoting Joel, Peter tells Israel that the tribulation and Christ's second advent as, ju as judge is the next event they should anticipate. But what about the sun being turn into darkness and the moon into blood as mentioned in um, the, by Joel and in Matthew 24, 29, and 30? That has not happened yet. Why? Because prophecy, as we will learn in Acts 9, was interrupted. The Lord's day is the tribulation and the kingdom which the Apostle John saw as mentioned in Revelation 1, 10, and 19. The terrible or notable day of the Lord, is specifically Christ's second coming. The vapor of smoke is most likely the destruction of Antichrist's army in the battle of Armageddon, Zechariah 14, 3 and 12, on the notable day. On that notable day, as mentioned in Nahum 1, 5 and 6, Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Joel says there will be pillars of smoke. Joel 20, 30. These may darken the sun and make the moon look red. The signs in heaven are the sun, are that the sun will be dark and the moon will turn to blood just before the judge comes, the terrible day of the Lord, Joel 2, 31 and 3, 12. As mentioned, the notable day of the Lord is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth. The Lord is calling out a remnant. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Joel 2.32 Peter quotes the prophet Joel before telling them that the name that the name that they should call on. <laughs> Very important. You gotta call on the right name. Go ahead, Patty 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. By miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Peter <laughs> says, hear these words, listen up. <laughs> Meaning, I will tell you the name by which you must be saved, Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> they are saved by believing that Jesus of Nazareth is the prophesied king of the Jews. The miracles, wonders, and signs Jesus Christ did was by the power of God. Christ was a man approved, certified, or verified of God from among Israel. Jesus did and spoke what the Father told him to in his word, John 8, 29, 12, 50. The miracles, wonders, and signs attested to the fact that God was doing um, with them by him in the middle of them all at, um, was doing for them by him in the middle of them all as they themselves knew. So they themselves were witnesses to Jesus Christ's life and signs and miracles. The signs and miracles 
were to point Israel to something. What Jesus did among them was like a neon sign with a big arrow saying, <laughs> this is the Messiah, 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. In Psalm 2, God prophesied that the people of Israel would conspire with the Gentiles to kill the heir, but that God would resurrect him to rule in Zion. Psalm 2, 1 through 12, Luke 49, 20. And um, Acts 13. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, Psalm 2 demonstrates that God had predetermined that his son would be delivered up by his people to be killed. Peter will quote and comment on Psalm 2 in chapter 4. Verses 23 through 28. So we're going to cover it at that time. The Godhead had determined or agreed or counseled ahead of time that Christ would be offered as a sacrifice. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8. The death of Christ was predetermined. It was not an accident that God failed to prevent. God had determined that Jesus would die, but that did not make those who crucified him guiltless. Jesus said, And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by which whom he is betrayed, in Luke 22, 22. In God's forbearance, he did not destroy unholy mankind, knowing that his holy son would pay for their sin debt. Romans 3.25, Hebrews 9.15, and 1 Peter 1.2. Peter does not tell them the good news of the cross like Paul did in Romans 3.21-32. On the contrary, Peter comes right out with the bad news of the cross. By wicked hands ye have crucified and slain your Messiah. Peter charged Israel with the murder of their Messiah. Guilt must be acknowledged. Conviction precedes conversion. Everyone must realize their need for a Savior. Through Paul, we know that Christ's death, which Peter accused Israel of, is the very basis by which God can offer salvation to all. But Peter was not commissioned to preach the gospel of the grace of God, nor did he know it as Paul did in Acts 20, 24, in Ephesians 3, 1 through 3. It was predetermined that God would deliver Christ to save mankind after Adam fell. As we said, he was the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. The great, uh, from the foundation of the world, I mean, lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The great shepherd willingly and purposely laid his life down for his sheep, as mentioned in John 10, 17, and 18. Christ overcame death by dying. He had to die in order to destroy death and Satan, who had the power over death. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He became flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him that had the power over death, that is, the devil. Hebrews 2, 14. Christ now has the keys to death and hell and the power over them. Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Revelation 1, 18. God's twofold purpose is to break the hearts of his people, Zechariah 12, 10, 11, 13, 6, and to save his heavenly people. Paul later revealed more reasons for Christ's death and resurrection. Paul preached the good news of the cross that saves a soul today, which is how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Okay, so our sins there is Jews and Gentiles in mystery. Jews and Gentiles were also saved in prophecy. 
according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. 24, Patty? <clears throat> Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Okay, you need water. Uh -huh. <coughs> the one they had slain is alive. You have time to take a sip, honey. Okay. God has... Okay, so the one that they had slain... Okay, I'll, I'll read that last verse. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. The one they had slain is alive. God has resurrected him with power. God raised him up, having set him free from the pain of eternal death, because it was not possible that he should be confined by it. Psalms which praise, worship, and thank God, and prophesy about Jesus, often reveal the inward thoughts of the Lord. Psalms 69, 15. Jesus Christ never sinned. So the justice of God demanded that death could not hold him. As mentioned in Luke 23, 41, Romans 6, 23, Hebrews 4, 15, 7, 26, and 1 Peter 2, 22. He had no sin. Death and the pit had no power to hold a sinless person, as we will find out in Psalm 110, <coughs> verse 1. Jesus had done nothing amiss, as was mentioned in, by the thief on the cross in Luke twenty three forty one. The justice of God demanded that the unblemished, sinless Son of God could not be held in hell. The grave vomited Jesus out like the big fish did with Jonah. Hmm. Jonah 2, 10, Matthew twelve forty and 41. This is why no ordinary man could have been the Savior. It had to be God. Mm -hmm. All mankind have inherited Adam's sin nature, Romans 5.12. So any ordinary man would be swallowed up and imprisoned by hell. But because of the Son of God's miraculous birth through a virgin, he did not inherit Adam's sin nature, Isaiah 14.7. Matthew 123, Luke 135. He also lived a perfect life and never sinned in thought, word, or deed. Then he died a perfect death, even experiencing man's second death in our place, as a worm, Psalm 22, 6, and the spiritual death of the separation from God the Father, Psalm 22, 1, and Matthew 27, 46, and Mark 15, 34. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me, right? Mm -hmm. He is this um, king of love. Patty, verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Okay, go all the way to um, uh, 28. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. 28. Oh, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Okay, so I'm going to... Um, take this um, Psalm 16 that Peter quotes apart. Okay. So here we go. For David speaking concerning him, Jesus Christ, I, which is David, foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand. David foresaw the Lord always before him, for he was at his right hand that I should not be moved. David will not be moved from trusting that he will be resurrected and have eternal life with him. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my, David's, flesh shall rest in hope. David will see Christ. His heart and tongue were glad. 
he was happy that God had let him know that he would be resurrected to rule with his Lord. His flesh, which is his body, will resurrect, will rest confident in the hope of being resurrected. The Holy One, the Son of God, could also rest in the certainty of the hope of being resurrected because he trusted the Lord to do what he said as mentioned in John 13, 3. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, David will not only be left in, will, David will not be left in hell, which is Abraham's bosom, as mentioned in Luke 16, 18 through 31. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one, Jesus the Son of God, to see corruption. Neither will God allow his Holy One, the Lord, to be left in hell to see corruption, decay, or decomposition. His soul will not be left in the compartment in hell called Abraham's bosom. Thou hast made, me know, uh, made known to me the ways of life. God let David know he and the Holy One would be resurrected. Psalm sixty nine fifteen, Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. The Holy One will have joy when he sees his Father face again and sits at the right hand. And, in fact, that is where he is, what he's doing right now. He's sitting way up there, at the right hand of the Father. And David will see Christ. Christ will sit on David's right hand in the kingdom, as we showed here. Um, <clears throat> as mentioned in 1 Chronicles 28.4, Jeremiah 30, verse 9, and Ezekiel 34, 23, 24, forever. Okay, so all of those scriptures that I just mentioned talk about the resurrection of David. Um, <clears throat> we don't have time to look at those. But they're in the notes, and the notes will be on God's Secret Facebook page, and along with this video. The Holy One is mentioned 52 times in the King James Bible. Notice the word flesh. Resurrection has to do with the body being raised up. David and Christ's souls went to the paradise compartment in hell, in the heart of the earth. Their spirit went to the Father, while their bodies rested in the grave. Hell... Hades in Hebrew and Sheol in Greek had two compartments, a torment side for the unbelievers and Abraham's bosom paradise for those who trusted in God. Luke 16, 1 through 31. After Christ was resurrected, paradise which was in the heart of the earth and the souls in it was moved to heaven, as mentioned in Luke 23, 43, and 2 Corinthians 12, 4. Hell then enlarged itself to take up both compartments, Habakkuk 2, 5. Both will be res uh, erected. The Holy One was resurrected without suffering corruption. Um, Holy Ghost-filled Peter said, David prophesied concerning Christ. The Lord will show David and his Holy One the ways of life as or resurrection in his word and then accomplish what he said. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. David will be resurrected and rule with Christ in Jerusalem. David, <clears throat> the great administrator, will be the vice regent as the king ruling over Israel, while the Lord Jesus Christ will rule over rule from Jerusalem over all of their world, the whole world. Ezekiel 37, 24 through 28. How did the Father show Jesus the way of life? Through this uh, Psalm 16 and other scripture, Jesus had faith in what was written in the Word of God and obeyed it, as mentioned in Isaiah 50, verses five, 4 and 5. Our faith rests on the faith of Jesus. Jesus Christ could be confident because God's Word um, said death could not hold him and decay would not happen to him. Um, unlike all others who were raised from the dead, Jesus did 
was raised to life again in a glorified body. Philippians 3.21 The body of Lazarus had been in the grave four days and corruption had set in. Christ was raised after three days before the body could corrupt. John 11.39 The third day was the sign of Jonas that Jesus would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12.40 Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 23. Paul said that some would be resurrected to have celestial immortal bodies, while others would have terrestrial incorruptible bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 4. So some will have celestial bodies, that's the body of Christ, while those that are going into the Kingdom on earth will have terrestrial, meaning earthly bodies. Go ahead, Patty. Verse 30. I mean, 29. Okay. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Having quoted Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, Peter now gives a commentary on those verses. Peter said to his kinsmen and brothers, Please allow me to be candid with you concerning our patriarch, forefather, David. He is dead and buried, and his grave is here with us today. David's flesh did see corruption. In fact, Peter could point to where his grave was on top of Mount Zion, and the dust of his body was in his grave. The Holy One is not David, but Christ. Go ahead, Patty, 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn unto, with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Peter said that David, being a prophet, knew that the Lord would raise him up. God had promised that one of David's descendants would sit on his throne. Since David's body did undergo corruption, the Holy One was not David, but one of his descendants. A prophet is someone who speaks the words of God on God's behalf. David wrote, My tongue is the pen of a ready writer, in Psalm 45, 1b. When did King David know that he would be resurrection? Dead? When Nathan said the words, before thee, thy throne, and forever. David had wanted to build God a house, but instead the Lord said he would build a house for David. 2 Samuel 7.27 The oath Peter is talking about is the Davidic covenant mentioned in 2 Samuel 2.12-29 and 1 Corinthians, I mean 1 Chronicles 17.7-14. David's descendant, Jesus Christ, would be raised to sit on David's throne as king. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Remember, unto us a son is given. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, David knew that God had said that one of his descendants would be this God's son. 2 Samuel seven fourteen. That would rule forever. The Lord should, shall build a house for his name, and his throne shall be established forever. David also knew that he would be resurrected, and his house, David's family, and his kingdom would be established forever before thee. That's in um, 2 Samuel 2.16. Before thee, meaning before thee, David. David's going to see it. God used the word forever eight times in 2 Samuel 7 through 12 through 29. Forever indicates eternal life. Nathan the prophet told David that God said, And it shall come to pass that, uh, and it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. 
He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So there we go. David's going to rule forever. Uh, verse 31, Patty. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Peter interprets Psalm 16, 8 through 11, and verifies that David can rest and be confident of the prophesied resurrection of himself and the Holy One, Jesus Christ. David was speaking of the resurrection of Christ. His soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Since Christ was has been resurrected, as David prophesied by the Spirit of God. Um, so God uh, raised David and other believers. So will God raise David and other believers, just as God has said. Okay? So, verse 32. This, di this Jesus hath God, God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. This Jesus of Nazareth has God raised up, and the twelve were all eyewitnesses of his bodily resurrection. They had seen him since he resurrected many times over a 40-day period, right? Mm -hmm. Verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Here is Peter's answer to their question. The fact that the Holy Ghost came proved that Jesus was exalted to God's right hand and had received the promise of the Father and sent forth this, which they now see and hear. This was that. They heard the sound, saw the flames, and heard the followers of Jesus speaking to them in their languages. The Holy Ghost being sent down was proof that Jesus Christ had ascended to the Father's right hand. This confirmed that Jesus was Christ the King to rule over the kingdom on earth. Peter had just mentioned three witnesses of the resurrection. The Word of God, the Apostles, and the coming of the Holy Ghost that the people just witnessed. 34, Patty, and 35. For David is not ascended into the heavens... But he saith in himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my he, right no, hand. No, but he saith himself. But, but he saith himself. But he saith himself. Yeah, the the Lord. Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Peter quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. David had not ascended bodily into heaven, but... David prophesied of Christ the Son sitting on the right hand of the Father in the third heaven. The Lord, the Father, said unto my Lord, the Son, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Psalm 110, 1. This is why when Stephen sees the Son standing in Acts seven fifty six. Jesus is ready to judge his foes and pour out his wrath on Israel and the world. Many of the enemies of Christ will be put under his feet at his second coming, but there will be a final rebellion that Christ needs to put down at the end of the millennial, his millennial reign, as mentioned in Revelation 20, verse 9. 36, Penny? Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter brings his sermon to a crescendo. The Holy Ghost was a tremendous sign of who Jesus of Nazareth was. Therefore, let all the body of Christ... No, wait a minute. Peter didn't say that. Peter said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know mm. assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter drives home the clincher. 
that they can be assured that God has made the same Jesus whom they crucified, both Lord, that means all authority to judge, and Christ, Messiah in Greek. Jesus of Nazareth is the Holy One that David prophesied about. The one they killed turned out to have the highest power and all the authority in all heaven and earth. Jesus Christ is the judge of all the earth, as mentioned in Genesis 18.25 and Joel 3.12. He is coming back in wrath to make his enemies his footstool. Did they want to meet him as their Christ, Messiah, or their Lord, the judge? Patty, 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? When they heard the Holy Ghost speak those words by Peter, the men of Israel were pricked in their hearts. This was the climax of Peter's speech, and their conscience was convicted of the truth that they had indeed called for the crucifixion of their Messiah. Conviction came upon the people, and many understood their guilt. They were struck by the fact that they had indeed crucified the Lord and Christ. Peter just warned them that the Lord was alive again, and that <clears throat> would make them his enemies, who were to be his footstool. Yikes! They had made a huge mistake. Horrified, they asked, what should, shall we do? Go ahead, Patty, 38. <clears throat> then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They sinned by crucifying their Messiah. Peter preached, Repent, and be baptized, which is the gospel of the kingdom, just like John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ had. This is exactly what Christ told them to preach. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Luke twenty four forty six through 48 Peter said, repent or change your minds about the who Jesus of Nazareth um, and believe that he is the Lord and Christ. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, declaring that you believe in him. He is the king and the, of the Jews, uh, and, and the Jews are to be his kingdom of priests. Washing with water was a ceremonial ritual needed for priests so they could would not die when they entered into the presence of the Lord, as mentioned in Exodus thirty seventeen through 21. Israel was and is to be a nation of priests to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the world. Um, as mentioned in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, 1 Peter 2, 9, and Revelation 5, 10. The 12 tribes are the showbread that Christ will use to feed his people. See 2 Samuel 7, 7. Jesus of Nazareth, who will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem, um, anyone who... Uh, no. <clears throat> okay. Anyone who believes this got water baptized in order to be identified with the believing remnant and to survive in his presence. Matthew 3, 10, 12, Luke 7, 29, 30. For those in Israel's program, not being baptized was a sign of unbelief. For the body of Christ to be baptized is a sign of unbelief. Paul was not sent to baptize, but to preach the glorious gospel of of what Christ did on the cross, 1 Corinthians 1.17. For us to insist on getting wet for salvation is to say that what Jesus Christ did was not enough. This is to insult God. We are forgiven by faith alone from apart from the works uh, of the law, Romans 
I mean 328 and 4 5. We are baptized without water by the Spirit into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12 13. This is the one baptism for this dispensation, Ephesians 4 5. Ignorant brethren are those who are not both biblical and dispensational. The Holy Ghost was calling on the national repentance of the house of Israel. God will sprinkle clean water upon them to clean them from their sins, Ezekiel 36.25. Their sins would go into remission, pardon, forgiven, remitted, when they believed and were water baptized until Jesus Christ would return to blot out their sins, as mentioned in 3.19. And they would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why does Peter keep pointing out that his name uh, uh, um, is Jesus of Nazareth? Because Jesus had told them that many would come claiming to be Christ, such as Antichrist, in Matthew 24, 23. If Jesus is Lord and has all authority, why is he not ruling in Israel now? For two reasons. One, Today, in the dispensation of grace, Jesus is calling out a people to live in heaven, Acts 15, 14 through 16. And two, Jesus will still save more of Israel and also some Gentiles in prophecy during the tribulation, and then more Gentiles in the kingdom. Romans eleven thirty two. He's concluded everyone under sin so he can have mercy on all. But I believe that the tribulation is the last chance for the Jews to be saved and enter the kingdom. 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as our Lord, as the Lord our God shall call. The promise of the Father is the Holy Ghost in connection with the new covenant mentioned in, by Jesus in Acts 1-4 and in Luke's gospel which was exclusively for Israel, Isaiah 59, 20, 21, and Psalm 147, 19, and 20. And behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high, Luke 24, 49. The Holy Ghost was God's fulfillment of the Spirit for Israel. The new covenant will be his spirit in them, which will cause them to miraculously, constantly think, speak, and act like Christ on his behalf. Luke 12, 12, 21, 15, Matthew 14, 26, and so on. Israel broke the old covenant. They could not keep the Ten Commandments. God solved this problem by promising that he would make a new covenant with Israel and with Judah. Under the new covenant, God will do in them by his spirit what they could not do on their own. God will cause them to do his will. He will put his spirit in them, give them resurrected glorified bodies, give them a soft heart toward him and write his laws on their heart. Read carefully Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and Ezekiel 36, 24 through 28. This is the only way they can be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles and inherit the promised kingdom in the promised land. The only way Israel will obey and do the law is to have the Spirit of God do so in them. God miraculously fills them and takes them over. God will open their graves and resurrect them. He shall put his spirit in them and place them in their land, and then they will know that he is the Lord, Ezekiel 37, 12 through 14. John wrote, But ye have an unction of the Holy One, and ye know all things. 1 John 2, 2. We have the same spirit of God in us, but we are baptized into the crosswork of Christ his death, burial, and resurrection, and placed by one spirit into another group, the body of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We have the same spirit, but because we still have the dead sin nature resident in our mortal bodies, we can still think with the old sin nature whenever we decide to, 
Galatians 5, 16, 17, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. In contrast, Apostle Paul exhorts us to make the choice to be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. The Holy Spirit does not take supernatural control of us or cause us to do His will. We must take each step and decide to overcome temptation by faith as His Spirit supplies the grace. We are functionally useful to God when through the Spirit we mortify the deeds of the body. If the, um, Romans 8.13 For Israel, His Holy Spirit completely took them over, which is the only way they will, would not sin anymore. Israel had failed God, yet God will bless Israel in the future for His name's sake as a testimony to uh, the nations. According to the New Covenant, God will write His commandments on their new hearts, soft, towards God, in their new glorified bodies in the future kingdom. Their believing, the believing remnant and those added to them who receive the Holy Ghost by the, believing the gospel of the kingdom were the first fruit or spring harvest to taste the new covenant. There will be a fall harvest. Later in Acts, we will find out that the kingdom has been postponed. Acts 9, 22, and 26, and Hebrews 2, 8. When Jesus rules, the law will go forth from Jerusalem, and all will know the Lord. Isaiah 2, 1 through 4, 11, 9, 10. Israel will be a kingdom of priests to save Gentiles in prophecy. Isaiah 60, 1 through 3, 61, 6. But first, they need to be washed and have the Holy Spirit. The afar off is not Gentiles in this case, but it's scattered Jews who were also to partake of the promise, as mentioned in Daniel 9, 7. God has never made a covenant with the Gentiles, Romans 9, 4. The Jews were dispersed from their land due to the Assyrian northern tribes of Israel and Babylonian southern tribes of Judah. They were removed out of their land by because of spiritual idol, uh, idolatry, Leviticus 26.33, into their captivities. Three parts of Israel were captured at different times, um, first Reuben and Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were taken captive, then Samaria, and then the rest of uh, Israel. The southern kingdom had three deportations by King Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. First, um, six, in 606 BC, King Jehoiakim at, or, um, and others like Daniel included. Um, and then in 597, King Jehoiachin, also called Jeconiah or Kaniah, and skilled craftsmen were taken to Babylon. And three, in 586 BC, Zedekiah uh, were taken captive. Jerusalem and the temple were burned. After so many warnings by the prophets to stop the, their idolatry and turn to God, the captivity of the people for a time was the only option for the Lord. Many returned to Israel after the 70 years in Babylon. Still many Jews remained scattered, but God promised to gather them back in their land one day, Jeremiah 46, 27. This regathering by God is yet future and did not happen in 1948. In early Acts, the Lord is calling out a believing remnant from among the nation of Israel, Joel 2, 32. In the future, God will make his nation over from the believing remnant. 40, Patty? And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Untoward is fraudulent, the apostate counterfeit Jews. Both John the Baptist and Jesus called them vipers in Matthew 3, 7 and 12, 34. The vipers didn't get water baptized, cleansed, because they didn't believe John or Jesus. The washing with water was a ritual needed for priests to survive when they went into the presence of God, Ezekiel, no, Exodus 30, 17 through 21. 
Jesus Christ had warned them to escape the damnation of hell in Matthew 23, 33, because the blood of the prophets was on them from their righteous Abel to, unto Zacharias, Matthew 23, 35. Peter said, that many, said many more things as he testified to them of Jesus Christ and urged them to be saved out of the unbelieving apostate generation in the nation of Israel, who would not be resurrected <clears throat> unto eternal life in the kingdom and receive his spirit um, of the new covenant. The nation of Israel was on the verge of judgment. It would be wisdom on the part of Israel to turn to God in repentance and faith rather than to continue in rebellion. God called the Jews in the last days the generation of his wrath. Jeremiah 7.29 and Matthew 23.36 The only way to be saved from physical and spiritual doom and damnation was to repent and be baptized. They needed to change their mind and believe that Jesus of the Christ of Nazareth was Messiah the King of the Jews. Israel will receive their glorified bodies in the kingdom after Christ returns and sits on David's throne. Resurrection in the earthly kingdom is the hope of Israel. He will open their graves and give them life, life to their dry bones. Um, the body of Christ received the indwelling Holy Spirit upon salvation and our glorified bodies at the rapture. Our hope is eternal life in heaven, 2 Cor um, Corinthians 5.1. God is saving two groups of people to live in two different realms on earth and in heaven. Patty, we're going to take a big chunk, 41 okay. through 47. Go. Okay, <laughs> 41. Yeah, we're, this is the end. This is the end. Oh. Go, Patty, go. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and signal, signalness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The word gospel means good news or glad tidings. They had heard the gospel of the kingdom, repent and be baptized. What was the response of the people of Israel to Peter's preaching? They gladly received what he said. They were thrilled to have a renewed opportunity for remissions of the sin of crucifying their Messiah, eternal life in the kingdom, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Three thousand were added to the kingdom church, which began when Christ was on earth. Matthew sixteen sixteen through 19. So many believers at one time were probably baptized by sprinkling of water on them using a branch of hyssop dipped in a bowl of water. Today we continue in sound doctrine and fellowship until we choose to think in the flesh again. That's us, but not for them. But these people were completely filled with the Holy Ghost so they could continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. The apostles' instructions included preparing the believers to endure to the end of the tribulation and into the kingdom. How did the Lord our God call believers in Israel? He saved those who gladly received his word and showed their faith by obediently being water baptized. 239 and Mark 16.16 16. The purpose of Pentecost was not to baptize Jews and Gentiles into one body. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It is essential to know that there are more than one church mentioned in the Bible. There's a church in the wilderness led by Moses, 
um, Acts 7, 38. The Messianic Earthly Kingdom Church, led by Peter, Matthew 16, 18. And the church, the body of Christ, mentioned in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Christ gave one commission to Peter's group, which is stated several times in the Gospels. The main purpose was the bringing in of his earthly kingdom into the promised land. Jesus is the Christ, the King of Israel, who will rule the world. This is the true one world government and religion. Satan likes to counterfeit what God does. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 the, work, the course of the present evil world is to set up a false one-world government and religion in Jerusalem run by Antichrist during the tribulation, the new world order. After this dispensation ends with the rapture. Like Nimrod at the Tower of Babel, Antichrist in defiance of God will want political power, fame, and worship. In Nimrod's time, the creatures worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Romans 1.25 Antichrist will do signs and wonders. At that time, only true believers in prophecy who read the Bible will know what is really going on. The commission of Christ in the Gospel of Mark mentions the sign gifts of the apostles. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Mark sixteen fifteen through 18 Christians who don't rightly divide often think um, that these gifts belong to them, which could be dangerous. The new kingdom converts continued steadfastly in the teaching of the apostles, eating together and praying. Fear, conviction of guilt, respect, and reverence of God who alone could save them into the kingdom came on every soul. The apostles' message was validated by the many wonders and signs they did by the power of the Holy Ghost. In contrast, we walk by faith in God's word, what God's word tells us, not by sight, since signs are not being done today. The signs of the of an apostle were given God given miraculous powers such as healing, the divine evidence or sign of their office. All of them were together and had all things in common. This is not communism, but a theocracy. The twelve were representing Jesus Christ until the rejected king in exile returns. They sold their possessions and goods and divided up the proceeds as everyone had need. Why did the believers sell their possessions? Because the Lord had told them to in Luke 12.33. They show their faith by their work of faith. Human selfishness and greed would prevent this from working today. But greed wasn't present among them because they were filled with the Spirit. Even those who in error claim that the body of Christ began in Acts 2 do not usually follow the sell all your procession verses. We're almost done, everybody. <laughs> Yay. Many believers in Israel cashed some of their possessions because they were not to take the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 18, 16, 2, and 19, 20. They continued with one accord or mind, meeting daily in the temple like Jesus did until they were thrown out. Of course, Gentiles were not allowed in the temple. Not everyone sold everything or they would not have houses to visit in. They took turns hosting and eating bread from house to house. They were able to eat together with gladness and, single, and a single heart because they were enabled and filled with the Holy Ghost, praising God and having favor with all men, with all, all the people. They had favor with the people who recognized that they preached good news. 
God was still accepting converts into the eternal kingdom. And the Lord added to the church more believers daily as people heard, believed, and were water baptized and received the Holy Ghost. Notice that it was the Lord that added to the Hebrew kingdom church. Nobody at that time knew about the 2,000 year gap in prophecy when God would deal with the Gentiles. The mystery, the body of Christ, had not been revealed yet. Ephesians 3, 1 through 7. God's word has, was written progressively. Keep in mind that at that time, the disciples did not know what we know from the word of God because it was not complete. Colossians 25, 20, oh no, Colossians 1, 25 and 26. So God revealed um, his plan progressively. And the last part of the Bible was what Paul wrote. They only had the Old Testament and what Jesus, while on earth, had told them. So they were preparing for the wrath in the kingdom on earth. According to prophecy, that would all happen within the next ten years or less. The remnant that survived will inherit the earth. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father God, we thank you that you helped us to finish this really long chapter, Acts chapter 2, um, within the two hours. And I know it's a lot of information, Lord. Um, that's why it's so great to have these notes. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to finish a book on Acts and to be able to release the first part um, within 10 weeks or so, Lord. Um, the first part that covers the first nine chapters. And Lord, we just um, thank you so much that um, you have helped us by your spirit to, do, um, to have insight into your word and to understand what you're doing now and will do in the future and what you've done in the past. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you next Thursday. Take care. Stay safe. <laughs>